So Bill Armistead, our guest tonight, is a retired businessman, having spent his career in corporate finance, including stints at Lockheed Martin, MCI, and a startup telecommunications company. For five years, he taught finance at American University in Washington, D.C. His mother was Peggy Skinner Armistead, who grew up at Dogwood, a large estate off Northampton Street in Holyoke, which was owned by her father, William Skinner II. And Elizabeth Skinner was Bill's great aunt and uh, lived over in South Hadley and was um, part of the Orchards development, and he'll tell you all about that. Bill has served on the boards here at Wisteria Hearst at the Berkshire Hills Music Academy, which, w which owns the former Skinner estate in South Hadley where Aunt Polly lived, right? That's right. So Bill has recently published his book, The Orchards, 100 Years which he wrote in, in a celebration of the Orchard Centennial Year. And he's considering another book about another golf course. So, How about that? Bill Thank Thompson. you. Thank you for being here. Thanks. <clears throat> it is a thrill to be here. I, I've been here many times, um, but I believe this is the first time I've uh, spoken here. So I, I spent a lot of time writing this book, and it, it was a, a labor of love. So therefore, I am thrilled to be giving this uh, story. Let me quickly apologize, I'm fighting uh, some allergies, so I'm gonna be clearing my throat a fair amount. So Penny has introduced um, me quite well. Um, I was raised in the suburbs of New York. My mother was Peggy Skinner, and every year or so we would come up and visit her father, who was William Skinner II a very warm, loving, generous person. And we would come up and visit Dogwood. Absolutely glorious. Unfortunately, this is a little bit out of focus, but I think it gives you a feel for what the estate looked like at one time. It's 1155 Northampton Street. It is absolutely glorious. This is the front part that was designed by the Olmsted brothers out of Brookline, Mass. We had plenty of room to uh, wander there. There were uh, apple trees in the back. He allowed us to drive a Jeep around the property. And he, he swear, I swear he had the best game room in the country. As kids, we loved it. From there, you know, during the same trip up from New York, we would go visit Elizabeth. She hated having her picture taken. So. And she lived, um, in South Hadley. This is the back of the property that's now the Berkshire Hills Music Academy. And she too, she was like her brother, very modest, caring, uh, inquisitive. She, when we were visiting her, she would never talk about her golf, and I will tell you about it shortly. Instead, when asked though, she would say, well, I guess I was pretty good, but that was a long time ago. And that would be it. <laughs> She would prefer to inquire about the goings-on of others than to talk about herself. That was, that was her way. All right, but enough of my recollections. Let me go back to the beginning um, and talk how the Skinners came to America from England. And what I'd like to do is, after I finish a chapter, if you will, maybe 10 slides, you'll see a blank slide, which means if you want to ask questions at that point in time, that might be a good time. Um, and then I'll go on to the next chapter. Is that going to work? Mm -hmm. uh, so are there any questions about uh, the house uh, or the houses that you have? Okay. We know that man, <clears throat> William Skinner the first. America, as we know, is a nation of immigrants. Um, but sadly, it's also a nation of slaves. Those who came of their free will did it for two reasons, either to escape oppression or to find opportunity. William Skinner in 1845 came to America alone at age 20 for both reasons. His family lived in squalor in East London. His father worked in a dye, dye mill in London, Spitalfields. His mother wove silk in their home but they made very little money. So when an opportunity arose for William to apply his talent at a dye house in Northampton, he jumped on it. He arrived in New York in 1845, and this is right before Ellis Island was built. 
This is a packet ship, not the one that he was on, but very similar to the Toronto, which is the one he did take. A couple of carriages then delivered him to Northampton, where he went to work for Edward Valentine, dyeing silk. In 1854, 11 years later, he decided to go out on his own. So he founded and built his own mill on the Mill River. This is in uh, Haydenville. It's about a mile south of Williamsburg and soon to be known as Skinnerville. And he became incredibly successful. In 1873, he was already um, bringing in $400,000 of annual revenue, which is an incredible sum in those days. He had 70 people working for him. He made silk threads and twists that went into garments. In May 15th of 1874, things changed. Let me preface this by saying that William might have thought about expanding his business because he was already cramped at this space, but he needed a more consistent supply of water. At some times, the, the, the Mill River got so low, he had to shut down his plant because the turbines wouldn't turn. So back to May of 15th of 1874, it was threatening rain when he went to sleep that night, which was good. It meant that the reservoir, which is in the dam, which was in Williamsburg, would be full, and he didn't have to worry about having enough water supply. The next day, a man <coughs> named Collins Graves came racing into town from Williamsburg, yelling that the dam had burst. The people had only 15 minutes to clear out. And indeed, that was true. In that time frame, a 10-foot wall of water came and wiped out the property. <clears throat> Here's a, site, a scene of the dam that had burst. This is the property. That's William's house, which but for you know, the porch pretty much survived. However, the Mill, I mean, this is where the mill was, and you saw what it looked like in the drawing. Now, there's the turbine. It was just destroyed. He, it was said that he lost $200,000 of equipment, inventory, and assets in that flood, the equivalent of $35 million today. His reputation was stellar, though, and it wasn't long before cities came knocking on his door. They wanted him to relocate, establish his business in their city, knowing that he would be able to attract uh, workers from the community, which would be a positive for each city. Holyoke was one. The Holyoke Water Company said, we will give you uh, rent-free property on one of our canals, a good, consistent supply of uh, water. We will uh, provide you a low financing uh, interest rate loan to build your mill and we'll give you some land on which to build your house. William said yes. And within a year, he took down the house, board by board, brought it to Holyoke, and it is now where you sit. Pretty amazing, really. <clears throat> you know, in time, you know, the mills became you know, one of the largest silk mills in the world produ producing the finest quality silk um, in America. Here it is from uh, 1912. Are there any questions about this part of it? I think it's a story that many of you already know, but I thought it it's important to sort of introduce it. Are we good? Joseph Skinner uh, was one of his sons. By the way, just to be clear, um, I'm related to William Skinner, whom I showed, just the first slide. He's the son of Joseph Skinner. Joseph Skinner was 11 years old when the flood hit, um, but he survived, as did the entire family. Um, you know, and they were lucky, really. Four people died in Skinnerville. There were 50 who died in Leeds, 60 in Williamsburg, and 25 in Haydenville. Um, it was a devastating, devastating flood. Joseph then 
came to Holyoke, he went to high school here, then went to Yale, and after graduating, he and his brother, six years later in um, 1883, took over running the family business. Joseph married um, Martha Hubbard of Danbury, and they, had, they lived in a large house not far from here, and they had four children. Uh, it was great in that it was convenient to the mills, but Joseph wanted to get away, to get out of town. You know, it was very smoky, dirty, uh, loud noises in the city at the time. And he wanted to get away where there would be a farm, an area where he could start farming and where the kids can enjoy clean air until school resumed. So they looked around, there's Martha, and saw South Hadley. This is Mount Holyoke College. And actually, he already knew the, the college. His father had been a board member, and Joseph uh, was a board member as well in 1905. In 1906, he found a piece of property just across the street from the college. It was a small house and only, I say only, 14 acres, but that's where the family spent their summers and then returned to Holyoke when uh, school resumed. It wasn't long before they realized we really should make South Hadley our year-round home. So in 1915, he doubled the size uh, of the house. He uh, brought in another 26 acres and started raising cattle and, uh, and chickens. <clears throat> that is a shot of the house, front of the house, circa 1926. Joseph fell in love with the college across the street, and they with him. William Skinner I had told his children to go out in the world and make good. As people of means, it was their duty to, to share their, their wealth, and they did. For Joseph, it was the college who was his primary beneficiary. One of the first things he did with his uh, brother Will was to provide the funds to build uh, Skinner Hall, a, a hall for uh, recitations. He worked with Mary Woolley, who was the uh, president of the college from 1900 to 1937. Mary Woolley uh, very much wanted to bring up, to elevate the standard of education that the girls were getting. But to do that, they needed to get funds, resources to attract um, the best professors in New England. And William Skinner had a hand in that. He provided fellowships for art, history, physics, and chemistry. He provided the funds to help build the president's home. He bought the Sycamores, uh, a house in South Hadley that the girls could use uh, as their dormitory while they were there. He did everything he could to keep the college in its best form and to help it grow. And he and Wooly were extremely successful in so doing. He was on the board for 26 years, 20 as its president. There he is on the right at a, uh, at a commencement, and Ambassador Morgenthal uh, is on the left. There's Joseph. Joseph lived large. There's no doubt about it. Uh, here he is in front of his, uh, his Rolls Royce. Uh, but that doesn't quite define the man. Like his father, he was a man of integrity. Um, but he did enjoy his, uh, his belongings. There's no doubt about it. This is sort of funny, though. Um, read that. If you can't read it, I'll say it. Bumming, this is from the handbook from sometime in the uh, 30s. Bumming is not allowed. But if someday, as you're waiting for the car to go into town, a long, <coughs> low, gray Rolls Royce draws up, and the man who was driving asks you to ride in with him, you needn't think you're bumming if you accept, because it's none other than Mr. Skinner, the president of the trustees. <laughs> Elizabeth was the second child, born in 1891. Here she is playing golf, um, believe it or not, at the age of 13 uh, at Mount Tom. She um, eventually went off to uh, Vassar, as all of her aunts did, uh, but she didn't play golf. Vassar wouldn't have a golf course until 1930. Instead, she ran track, and she was first violin in the orchestra. There's no doubt that Joseph encouraged 
his daughter to pursue whatever path in life uh, he wanted. After college, <clears throat> Elizabeth came back to the home, in part to help the family with her mother. Her mother had debilitating rheumatoid arthritis, and there was no cure, no drugs to help relieve the pain. And in time, she became wheelchair bound and seldom left the house. But Elizabeth did, and she wanted to, uh, when she wasn't helping her mother, to get out and be active. Um, as a, for instance, she was the first person, one of the first women in Massachusetts to get a driver's license. She was only 14. 16 was the normal age, but because she lived on a farm, she can get it at 14. She was definitely the most ad adventurous um, and athletic of the four children. Eventually, the three children, other three siblings moved out of the house, but Elizabeth remained. She never married. Um, and instead, she spent a lot of her time playing golf. But she had to travel to Mount Tom to do that, which was, I don't know, a 20 minute car ride. Not that Elizabeth really cared. She never complained about anything. But Joseph wanted a more convenient place for her to play. So he came up with a solution. He had met a man at Mount Tom. Joseph was a, a charter member who had built some holes at the course. All he needed to do was call up this man, uh, have him come to the Skinner estate, look at some property across the street that Joseph wanted to build, and get going on a project for Elizabeth. And so he hired Donald Ross. Let me stop here. Are there questions uh, going back? Would you have to know what hole number that is? Oh, I. Uh... <laughs> The reason why I'm trying to pinpoint where the old golf was, and it's so hard. Well, part of the problem is, as you know, 91 took out a lot of the holes. I know. And, and so I have no clue. Well, I was hoping to be putting that in the back. No, no. That is the Mount Tom? I, I, let me say this. I believe it is. Yeah. I, I mean, I can't fathom where else it would Wyckoff? be. Was it the Wyckoff? Yeah. Well, see, yeah. Well, Mount Tom became Wyckoff. Uh, I just can't imagine where else uh, it would be. <clears throat> Joseph was a member of He was a charter member. That's right. And so I'm thinking, well, and I knew that they allowed women to play because the girls from the college often went to Mount Tom. So when you put those two together, it had to have been Mount Tom. That's my conclusion. Right. You, you know, if there was a hole, you said they bought the hole early on and then they made it bigger? Yes. Was it did they make it bigger by taking out the original hole or built expanded upon it? That's a good question. I believe they expanded upon it. Okay. But I, I don't know that for sure, but that's my understanding. Okay. Donald Ross was born in Dornoch, Scotland, 200 miles north of Edinburgh. Um, he was born in 1872. And in 1899, and at the time he was the head groundskeeper, uh, pro, making clubs, giving lessons, also digging in the dirt, you know, to, to repair all the bunkers and the like. And when the winds blew out of the Northeast, that was a part of the job he really did not like. When Oakley Country Club, outside of Boston, offered to pay him triple what he was making in Doorknock, Ross said yes. So he came to America in 1899, and worked for Oakley. He thought he would be giving lessons and making clubs, but what they really wanted was for him to add 11 holes to their golf course so that they can have the full 18. So at the age of 27, Ross set to do that. And when it was done, everyone was thrilled. And that was the first of the over 400 courses Ross would build, mostly in the States. Ross had a, a heavy workload, and um, he established an office in Pinehurst. He loved the, the uh, sandy loam down there, which is the best for soil for golf. So very soon, he established uh, an office there and started building courses, a couple of courses there. Pinehurst number two is his most famous course. But he would go back to Oakley in the, in the summer and, uh, and give lessons. Soon his reputation began to spread, 
And Louis Wyckoff, um, a wealthy businessman from Holyoke, who is uh, a, a big promoter of golf um, and who was another charter member at Mount Tom, met him in Boston, met Ross in Boston, in around 1912. And he asked Ross to come to Holyoke and to add four holes to his club uh, in Mount Tom. Ross said yes, he had to finish another project, but he did eventually come in 1913 and um, added four holes. Ross was impressed with the man, <clears throat> um, both as an architect as well as having a certain business savvy. And he encouraged him to drop what he was doing with Oakley and in fact to expand his business dramatically. The demand for golf courses, for good golf courses in America was huge. And he was right. It's likely that Wyckoff offered to underwrite uh, Ross to give him the funds, to bootstrap him so that he could really expand his business. Uh, whether or not he did, what is clear is that Ross then, his business began to explode. He would hire associates to do uh, much of his work around the country when he couldn't get to a project. One of his associates was a gentleman named Walter Hatch. Walter Hatch is from um, North Amherst. And um, it's clear that he was the primary designer of the first nine holes at the orchards. It's not clear that or definite, and there's no proof that Ross was there for the first nine. Um, but again, I think that he probably was there at least early on to assess the property. Why? He was back, he came back to Mount Tom in 1921 and 22 to add more holes to the club. It's hard to fathom that he would not have traveled across the river to look at Mr. Skinner's property, a prominent businessman whom he knew. By the way, Ross lived in Holyoke for uh, two or three years, not year round, he would be down in Pinehurst, but he lived here a fair amount, acting as the uh, groundskeeper as well as designer at Mount Tom. And that's how um, Joseph Skinner, through his friendship with Wyckoff, uh, got to know him. This is not um, of the orchards, but it is, it's taken of pine needles. But I got this from the, uh, the Ross archive down in Pinehurst. This is how courses were built. You know, even though there were tractors that were, came out after World War I, they had not yet been deployed in 1921 for the making of golf courses. Horses and pans, you know, here they are sculpting a, a bunker. Here is, um, in, in, so in 1921, in August 5th of 1921, after about a year and a half of construction, Joseph brought a carriage house from his property across the street, located it here, added on a porch and some other amenities, and this became the clubhouse. And on August 5th, 1922, the first ball was struck. Wow. Yeah. It, it doesn't exist. No, this exists. Huh? Yeah. Okay, yeah. That, no, that's what I said. I was like, that looks like a little Then, it was a carriage house, which he then expanded. And he didn't build a new carriage house. Well, I don't think so. <laughs> now, five years later, um, Joseph decided he wanted to see another uh, nine holes. So he called up Ross again. And this time, there's no doubt Ross was there. We have clear evidence that he was. The other difference is that then tractors were starting to be deployed for golf course construction. So the construction time was far, far less than, um, uh, than the first nine. <clears throat> Ross and uh, Joseph were then walking the property. You know, the, the carriage house is down around Woodbridge Street, you know, which is fine, but the property extends up. And they were looking for a piece of property with a higher elevation with a great view of the Holyoke mountain range where they might relocate the golf course, the, uh, the clubhouse. Um, <clears throat> at, when they found the spot that they liked, Ross said, Mr. Skinner, where can I hook up the water for the clubhouse? To which Joseph said, great Caesar, there's no water. The, this, the town of South Hadley could not pump water to that elevation. Therefore, the clubhouse would have to remain at Woodbridge Street. 
Oh but, for a oh, but for the lack of a strong pumping station, they would have had that for a view. Instead, they would have to settle <coughs> for the orchards being one of the, the better layouts for sure in Western Massachusetts. Here it is, these are the original nine holes and then the others that were added on. There were a few holes that changed slightly, um, but pretty much um, the way it is. Yes? Is it at the Oakley Country Club where there's a library? I think there is something. They're, they, they're trying to make a big deal of it. And I, they, I sent them something from the orchards because they wanted to have a piece of every, every course that Ross had designed. So there's a very good chance. And I think his daughter, Lillian, had something to do with Oakley. Well, maybe after the fact, because in fact, she went to Mount Holyoke. Mm -hmm. um, she got married. At Mount Tom, at the clubhouse. Have you read my book? <laughs> well, tell me if I'm going wrong any place then. <laughs> okay. In 1921, um, Jimmy Young, who's in the middle, came over, uh, actually had come over from Scotland in uh, 1910. He had married a, another Scottish lass. Um, named Minnie Fox. They met at the Caledonian Club, is that what it's called? And they were married in 20. In 21, they moved out temporarily or quickly. They didn't think it'd be temporary, but to Detroit to work for Henry Ford. But when Ford had to lay off some people, they found that they were stranded. While they were out there, Jimmy was introduced to the gentleman on the left, whose name is uh, Jock uh, Hutchison, who is the 1921 PGA champion, and in 22, he would be the British Open champion. On the right is Johnny Banks, who would end up being the, uh, the pro, or who was the pro, at Mount Tom. They were all from St. Andrews. Um, Hutchinson said, look, Jimmy, golf is exploding in America. You should go back to South Hadley and become a golf pro. Banks was the one who knew that Joseph Skinner was looking for a pro. So it was that year in 21 that, in fact, Joseph hired uh, Jimmy Young. Jimmy uh, would teach students. He was the first PGA professional to teach uh, women students, uh, it is thought. And he also took care of the caddies, amongst other duties. Look at the flagpole. It's about twice the guy's size. I'm not sure when this was, but probably around 1930. I can just tell by the, the lack of trees. And here he is, lower right, and I think this is sometime in the, uh, in the 40s. The caddies would make maybe a dollar a round, and maybe a 50 cent tip. You know, Jimmy Young would have them uh, strap boards to the bottom of their shoes with nails protruding, and have them walk on the greens as a way to aerate the greens. <clears throat> but Elizabeth uh, was his primary responsibility. It was part of his job description, in fact, that he play with her every day, uh, and he did. And he, he was an excellent player, but also a patient teacher. And it wasn't long before she developed truly into a, a champion. She would often invite uh, men golfers from other clubs to come play with her. You know, she wanted good competition, and oftentimes men were the only way to, uh, to get the best um, experience. And she wasn't afraid to ask them Give me some tips, please. I, I, I need some help. She built two holes behind the estate, long enough to accommodate her mashie, which is known really as a, a six iron in today's parlance. She built a, a putting green in the back. She did everything she could to advance her game, and, and she did. And she was long. Um, there was a driving contest that was held at one of the clubs. And she won the contest, contest by hitting a 222-yard drive. Now, considering the equipment and, and the ball, that is an amazing feat. Now, I'll probably admit that the ground might have been hard. You know, there was no uh, irrigation system. So maybe she got 50 yards of roll. I'm not sure. But still, she was a long, long hitter. Imagine what she could do with today's right? Yeah, who knows? She said that her, her, her most favorite in experience at the club was the day she played with Joe Kirkwood, 
who is a, a pro from Australia, who Joseph had invited to come play. On the left is my grandfather, William, and Joseph is next to Kirkwood. Anyway, that day, probably inspired by Kirkwood's presence, she shot a 74 at the club from the women's tees, um, and that set a, <clears throat> a record for the course that would not be broken for the next 41 years when none other than Pat Bradley, future Golf Hall of Famer, broke it. She started bringing home trophies. Um, this is one from Longmeadow. They spelled her name incorrectly, but she was the one. But her most prestigious award was the Endicott Cup. This is given to um, the person who plays in a tournament for the best women from Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. To have won it once would have been a huge achievement, but she did it twice in 1930 and 1931. <clears throat> Here's a shot from 1938. On the left, you see the Skinner Estate. Here is the Joseph Skinner Museum, you might recognize. And, and on the far right is the clubhouse. And you can also see a couple of holes. Number uh, 18 and uh, number two today. Silverwood Terrace hadn't been built yet. One year later, in 1939, Elizabeth was skating on the, uh, the pond at the college. She fell and fractured her wrist. And obviously it was not set properly because the next time she went out to play, when the course reopened in May, she still had pain in her wrist. In fact, the pain would never go away. She struck her first ball in the first hole and it didn't go even 150 yards, a distance that she would always easily carry. So the story goes that she went to the, her ball, picked it up, put it in her pocket, and never competed competitively again. She would continue to play, um, but usually it would just be nine holes in that 18 and never in a tournament. It was at this time that Joseph thought that he should part with the course, and he offered it to Jimmy Young, the pro, for a certain price, but Jimmy couldn't come up with the financing. Instead, he went to the college, or he was about to go to the college and give it to him. But a lawyer friend said, well, it's probably better if you get some consideration for it, some price. So he went to the college and offered the course to Roswell Ham, who had taken over for uh, Mary Woolley in 1937. That in itself is another story. It was very... Uh, uh, contentious, am I right? <clears throat> so, as 1940, but he continued Woolley's um, emphasis on education and fundraising. But in 1941, he was presented with another opportunity to buy the course under underlined in red for $25,000, which he did. Questions? Yeah. Do you have uh, any dates by any chance for some of those photos? Uh, I, can, I can find that out. Um, I got it from uh, Billy Young, who's Jimmy's last surviving son, but he's not in a good way, so I'm not sure I'll get a cogent answer, but I can ask a cousin of his. <clears throat> I have a photo, I think it's taken the same day, and it has those three golfers plus one more, and they have the same clothes on, so that's why I'm saying it might be the same day. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, here's Joseph and Elizabeth in 1945. As you can see, just by the appearance, uh, Joseph w uh, was not well. And in fact, the year later, he died. He left the estate to the college, but with the understanding that Elizabeth could live there the rest of her life, which she did. And in fact, she lived there another 31 years. While Joseph was very, you know, opulent and he had he entertained in a grand manner. Elizabeth was not that way, even though she lived amongst all these beautiful possessions in the house. She was more reserved and, and would prefer you know, not to go out and socialize. Um, she didn't like small talk, which often comes with big parties. Instead, she liked to invite a friend or two in for a nice, warm conversation. 
but she lived amongst beautiful things. I'm glad to say that's my mom uh, on the right, in a Skinner satin, no doubt. <clears throat> but as you can tell, it, it was grand, you know, with beautiful rooms and art. That's the dining room. Is that you? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was filled with uh, Tiffany lamps. There's a standing one. This is spectacular. It's a smaller one, just gorgeous. As well as fine art. This is from George Ennis from the uh, Hudson River Valley called um, Sunset on the River. I thought you would enjoy seeing that. <laughs> there are more, but for want of time. <laughs> Let me skip ahead now to 1987. So 1987, the United States Golf Association um, you know, paid a huge compliment to the orchards when it decided to hold its national tournament for girls age 16 and under. And in fact, the selection made sense. Think about it. It was a course that was built for a woman. It's owned by an all-women's college whose female students compete on it. It made total sense. Plus, it had a Ross pedigree. One of the favorites was um, Vicki Getz from Georgia. She drove up uh, to the tournament with another girl from, uh, and her family from Georgia. They stayed in a hotel, as most of the girls did, but some, such as Vicki, did not. Um, oftentimes, families would not travel for whatever reason, but instead, local families would bring them in. Uh, she spent uh, the week with the Orland family from uh, South Hadley, and they became great friends. So there's Elizabeth and my mom. Uh, they were invited to the welcoming dinner um, at Willett Hollowell. Again, you know, Elizabeth seldom went out, but she was happy to do this. The welfare of the course was always very important for her. So mom did not have to drag her out by any means. <laughs> um, the, what it was, it was two days of, if you know golf, two days of uh, metal play, stroke play, and then um, six rounds of match play, one against one, and at the end, the winner would be declared. The finalists were Michelle McGann on the left and Lynn Nicholas from California on the right. Elizabeth was invited by Bob Bontempo, the pro at the time, to come say hello and to greet the finalists. Here she is greeting Michelle McGann wishing them luck, and she did the same with uh, Lynn Nicholas. As it turns out, Michelle destroyed Nicholas, uh, winning seven and six, if you know the gar golf parlance. It was a uh, very impressive win. She would go on, uh, she would immediately retire from uh, amateur golf. She was named Amateur of the Year by Golf Magazine um, and turned professional. But she always remembered um, her time at the orchards, even 25 years later, saying how, what wonderful fun it was and how thrilled she was to be carrying the, the Vare Trophy, which is now down in New Jersey at the Golf Hall of Fame. Questions there? I'm just absorbing everything. And I just to you'll, be, you'll be tested. Well, I just wanted to add about Michelle McGann. <laughs> so she was in the... U.S. Women's Senior Open. Yes, she I was. Fairfield. Yes, she and was. I had a chance to talk to her when on the putting green, <clears throat> and I brought up the orchards, and she was. She lit up. She lit up and said, "It's still <laughs> one of her fondest memories." Yes. Playing golf. Well, let me tell you a quick story, if we're okay with time. Okay. Um, Michelle McGann played very well. So they had two days of normal golf uh, stroke play, and whoever had the lowest score for those two days would be the medalist and would be assured a position in the match play competition, which would then follow. She played great on the first day. The second day, on the front nine, she started to, to weaken. She's a type one diabetic, and she wasn't managing her uh, meds or really her food very well. She was struggling to make it to the turn. Um, her father, Bucky, said that she survived on pure guts. Finally, she got some bananas and water and other nutrients on the 10th hole, and some more in the 13th. And she ended up um, shooting a 31 on the back. 
so that she was uh, one of the three uh, medalists. She was very, very good. Here, Elizabeth is actually with my sister, Meg. As I said, um, Elizabeth um, often didn't go out, but she would invite people in. She enjoyed warm, private conversations. Um, either someone who would talk politics or, or whether, whatever with her, or to play bridge. She was a very good bridge player. Um, but she was reserved. Um, and, and the people would, however, the people whom she invited in, um, there was no social status that attached to them. As publisher William Dwight noted, quote, Elizabeth could have been one of those Kipling characters who could, quote, walk with the mighty and keep the common folk. And it's true. Um, she could relate to anyone, uh, just about. All who knew Elizabeth enjoyed her pleasant demeanor and her generosity. She was reserved, but insightful. Modest, yet having much to be immodest about. That was her way. In her later years, she spent a lot of her time in this room. And there's a TV set in there, and it was usually tuned to golf. Seve Ballesteros was her best, her favorite player. Elizabeth, Elizabeth could always split the fairway when she drove, but Ballesteros could never find one. But he always found a way to win, and that's what she liked about him. Five weeks after the girls' championship came to a close, Elizabeth passed away. The college lowered the flag on the campus to half staff, and a, memo a memorial note was placed at the base of it. In 2015, Elizabeth was inducted in memoriam to the Western Massachusetts Golf Hall of Fame. Whenever asked, Elizabeth would always say that father built the course because he wanted the townspeople to have a nice place to play, but everyone knew he had built it for her. Here's a picture of a, of a tree. It replaced the old apple tree, which was a signature tree next to the fourth uh, green. It, it died in about 2008. Members paid for a new tree and they put this plaque up, uh, which reads, Elizabeth Skinner, the first lady of golf at the orchards. Questions before we go on? Do we have time to do more? We're good? Keep going. Yeah. Let's talk about the Women's Open. Um, obviously, I'm st skipping ahead now. This is 2004. But obviously, it was, a, uh, it was a shock, quite frankly, when the USGA said, we want to have the Open at the Orchards. And quite frankly, it was because the course that they wanted to use out in California, at the last minute, realized that they had to do some incredible construction to get the course ready and it would not be ready in time. So Joan Fay, the wife of David Fay, who is the head of the USGA, learned about this conundrum that they were suddenly in. She had just attended a reunion, she went to Mount Holyoke, and went back and said, told her husband about the orchards. He was vaguely familiar with it, but he then called up the Mass Golf Association and they said, yeah, it's a great course. So, lo and behold, the best women golfers in the world came to play. One of them was Annika Sorenstam. She was clearly the favorite. She was already inducted into the uh, Women's Hall of Fame. And here she was playing in the Open. I mean, she was the one to beat and everyone knew it. However, there was a young phenom, <clears throat> Michelle Wee, who was only 14, and she bypassed the uh, qualifying, she did not otherwise qualify, but the USGA gave her an exemption. And for good reason. Uh, she certainly had the talent. Uh, and also, they knew, quite rightly, that people would be attracted to come see her, including parents with their young daughters in tow. The first day, uh, Brittany Lincecum uh, had an eagle on the 15th hole, and from that, she became the, uh, the leader in the first round. 
There was another person playing, Meg Mallon. She was a, a veteran, and she'd won the US Open 10 years earlier down in Colonial. She was hoping she could find some magic again and bring back another USGA Women's Open Championship. And in fact, she did. She ended up beating uh, Sorenstam by two strokes at the end. An interesting story on the side, Sorenstam was staying in a house on the 13th fairway. And that, the, the first night, there was a, uh, a bad thunderstorm that woke her. And she had trouble getting back to sleep. But she had to go to a, meet a 7 a.m. tea time the next day. She said she didn't get much sleep that night. And it sort of showed her, her when she finished the round the first day, it was not her best score. So she was sort of starting from behind. Shall we do more? Uh, um, here are just some scenes um, from the clubhouse and the like in the, uh, the mid-90s. Those of you who used to play it way back when might recognize it. That's the color. Then it's now uh, a yellow. Let's talk quickly about Mount Holyoke College. Mount Holyoke College has owned the course since 1941. And the, re the relationship they had with the club, if you will, is um, whenever the club uh, and their members um, needed capital improvements, the college would loan them funds. And they'd give a low interest rate loan that the members would repay. They wouldn't charge rent to the members. So it was a pretty good deal um, for the members, so long as you know, they didn't have, big, have to do big capital projects that they would have to eventually repay. <clears throat> um, in 19... 95, I believe it was, the club said it needed a million and a half dollars for some renovation, which is a very large amount, much larger than the um, college had been lending them in the past. It was around that time, a couple years later actually, that some of the board members of the college said, let's review all of our physical assets. Specifically, let's review those assets that are not related to education, such as the village commons such as the orchards. We should be getting a 10% return on those assets if they're not used for education. The appraiser said, all right, we believe the course is worth $4 million and you should be getting $400,000 a year from whomever is leasing it, be it the members or another outside group. The members thought that was way too high. They only bid 250,000. They said, there's no way. There's no way the numbers are gonna work but the college saw it otherwise and entered into a 25-year lease with, uh, with the Arnold Palmer Group, which expires in, uh, in two years. So it's gonna be very interesting to see what the college does in two years. Will it, it won't renew with Palmer, but will it continue to own the course? We don't know. They stopped their golf program. This is their 1995 golf team. They, they discontinued it saying it was too expensive and there was not enough interest. Um, many of us, including the woman being held here, um, are concerned and she's lobbying the college to, uh, to keep it, to bring the program back. There is a new uh, president who is an interim president and I believe it's a she, she, right? And she has said that she wants to join the orchards and we said well, that's good news. Um, but she's only interim, so we don't know what's going to happen um, when she's replaced eventually. Has anybody played there? I don't know if that's anybody else played there. <coughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, I own a property that abuts the driving range. What's that? I, said, I, I own a property that abuts the driving range. Is that right? Because we're out on the other side of the bus. How about that? So How about that? Here's Bob Bontempo uh, early on in the middle. Um, Fred Lane is on the right. He was president of the club at the time. And this is a representative from the college whose name slips my mind at the moment. So they were the ones who were discussing over the years how much the club needed and how much the college would be providing them. I just have some shots of Jimmy Young and some, some other things. But here's the clubhouse today. It's yellow. It's been improved nicely, but it really hasn't been expanded very much. You know, we would like to have 
um, another USJ event. But the, the criticism of the orchard for that purpose is the clubhouse is too small, um, and also the practice facilities are too cramped. Um, so I think the best that we could hope for, which would be fine in my book, would be to bring the girls back. They don't need the hordes uh, of space and the like that the, uh, the women do. So I apologize, I'm now getting into sort of assorted um, slides without the story, not thinking we'd ever get this far. <clears throat> but this is a, a blueprint that uh, Walter Hatch did. What decade ago? Sorry? Approximately, approximately what decade is that? This was done in 1921. <clears throat> <Okay>. <clears throat> Here is, um, if I can put my sales hat on, um, I had a professional photographer take pictures such as that, and these are in the book. Everything you see, by the way, is in the book, except for this first four slides about uh, William Skinner and... Um, and dogwood, uh, and this is one. That's beautiful. Yeah, there's another. Is, is the membership strong now still? <clears throat> yes, it is, but not as strong as we would like. Part of the reason is the, it's now being um, leased out to a group from Dallas called CBIG, and they're doing a great job, but they're saddled with this 400,000 annual rent payment that they have to pay to the college. Actually, they've reduced it to 350. But still, that is such a high price that to even come close to break even, which they're not, they've had to raise the annual dues to $5,000. For a club that only has golf, and only golf, for an area that's prosperous but not wealthy, that's a lot. And so membership, they could still use some more members, quite frankly. Just another uh, photo. Bob Bontempo and, and Ed Tuick, he was a pro for a while. Um, Joseph, um, amongst other things, um, bought uh, Mount Holyoke and the old hotel and the 375 acres that went with it. Um, in 1940, he donated all of it to the state of Massachusetts. There's Minnie Young. Again, I apologize. I didn't think I'd ever get this far. Uh, this is Minnie Young, who was the, uh, the wife of Jimmy Young. Uh, she lived to be uh, 97. Um, so she died maybe 12 years after her husband. They're both buried in uh, Evergreen Cemetery, if you know where that is in South Hadley. This is one of my pride possessions. It's Aunt Polly's original untouched scorecard from 1921. I mean, there are many things we can learn from this, really, about Joseph, right? What I like to focus on is here. Please pay caddies only the regular charge. Players are not permitted to buy balls from caddies. Well, is he trying to protect the members from being, you know, swindled by the little rapscallions? You know, I, I don't know. Sunday playing will be allowed in the afternoon only, but without caddies. Joseph um, taught Sunday school, actually, at the, at the First Congregational Church. He thought that everyone should be in church. So play didn't open up until um, 12 chimes came from the, the tower at Mount Holyoke College. Here are just some of the players who, I don't know if you know any of these people, but there's Jimmy Young later on, Ray Roberts, um, uh, Billy Jr., Harold Warner and Tom Chafee. <laughs> we don't really need to go into these. This, I have some of these. These are in the book. This is a scene from, uh, Mount, uh, from um, St. Andrews, where all three of those golfers were from. And it is true that back in the day, this was 1901, um, the cheap <laughs> you know, were, in fact, helping to uh, cut the grass, if you will. Is that artwork, the Skinner's? No. I, um, I, I leased a lot of, or licensed a lot of the artwork, uh, and this is from Bridgman Art. I can't remember the artist's name. It's in the book. Oh, I'm afraid that's it. Yeah. So, <laughs> again, the end was a little bit out of sorts, but you understand. Yeah. Well, of course, it's still much like Yes, and thank you for bringing that up. Um, in 1973, 
the course was a little bit in disrepair and the members as well as the college decided that they should uh, do some um, uh, rehabilitative work. So they brought in an architect who changed a couple of the greens rather dramatically. And the members realized this is not good. It, it was totally different than what Ross had designed. So the members told them to stop. It was the third green and the eighth green. But for those two greens, it is an untouched Donald Ross, which is really unusual in this day and age. Most of the times you'll have a, at a wealthy club, the chairman of the Greens Committee will say, that damn bunker on 14, get rid of it. You know, the orchards didn't have any money. They, they couldn't get rid of anything. Just cut the grass, that's all we can do. So, you know, in a way that was a good thing. Yeah. At, at Wyckoff, five of the hole was still the original. Yes. But the rest had to be changed. <clears throat> because in 91. Yeah, for that reason. Yes. I'm curious what influence that golf course has had on um, <laughs> UMass's turf management program that they had up there for a long time. I know. I, I, you know, <laughs> the history of managing golf course turf is. Well, I can tell you. Right? I can tell you. I played it yesterday, and it is in fabulous condition. So credit to the current management. Even though they're losing money, they are keeping it in beautiful shape. So if you ever get an invitation, take it. Yeah. I lived in South Animals, but my book seems to go through phases. Yes. Where they try and get rid of property. Yes. Where it's land or homes. Yes. And then they go through phases that buy homes and buy land. I know. And one of the I represent the college for a bunch of times with properties that they were unloading. And they were in such a horrible disrepair. I, I actually own one of them as a, as a rental property, and it's all gorgeous now. Well, let me give you one little story, and then I am going to stop. Um, after uh, Elizabeth died uh, in 1987, obviously the college then took full possession of the house. And we weren't quite sure what they were going to do with it. We thought the president would move into it. I mean, it's a fabulous place for a president's home, but they already had a president's home. So they rented it out to some people and a uh, Yiddish bookstore, I think it was, and a couple of others. Finally, they decided, let's put it on the market. They received two bids. One bid was from a, a group uh, uh, of families from Boston. And one of the parents had a child with Williams syndrome. And they wanted to buy it as a place for other kids with Williams syndrome. It would be their, their college, if you will, their college years. Williams syndrome is something where, in my non-medical term, the left side of the brain is dead, but the right side's on steroids. And one of the things that they are great on is music. So that was one bid. Another bid was from a developer. He bid half a million dollars more, but the college said, no, we want the kids to be here. If there's that mindset that is still there on the board, albeit this was 20 years, 22 years ago, that would be great. But I think there's probably been a lot of turnover since then. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. That was wonderful. Good, good.